so welcome everybody uh, to this talk. So we are talking about uh, Kubernetes operators with Ansible. And uh, here is the agenda, so quick introduction. Uh, we'll talk about Ansible and how it matches with uh, Kubernetes and how, what we can do together. I will guide you through some steps regarding building an operator Ansible, uh, an Ansible-based operator, going through some of the best practices on the field with a uh, tight network. Uh, discuss about real-world examples, which kind of projects are actually using uh, Ansible-based operator, and uh, go on with, uh, with a demo. Uh, so my name is Sylvain Chen. I'm based in Switzerland uh, for the last eight years, uh, working for Red Hat for seven years. Uh, yeah, I've played around with Ansible since uh, quite a while, also with uh, containers more or less at the same time, so containers and Ansible. And uh, yeah, I'm still trying to learn like uh, local Swiss dialect, uh, which is uh, rather hard uh, in Switzerland because they already have like three uh, national uh, official languages and there is a fourth adding up with that. Uh, so before starting, I'd like to do a quick survey. So who has played around with uh, Ansible? Who is more towards Kubernetes? And who has played around with both? All right, good. Thank you. Uh, so we talk about like containerization of Ansible. And so there are different, basically two different ways or two different schools. One is regarding execution environments. So basically, you want to package uh, all your dependencies in one single container image to basically run your playbooks. And this is usually done with, uh, uh, yeah, with uh, execution environments. So they contain, you know, Ansible Core, the runner, Python version, and all the dependencies that you can find. So we are talking about RPMs, we are talking about collections, and also some uh, Python modules. And that's one part on it. But then if you want to play around with Kubernetes and basically have some kind of event-driven architecture based on event, you can also do it with the operator. And the difference with the operator and execution environment is basically that the operator has some logic to basically bridge the event from Kubernetes and basically launch uh, some playbooks or even some roles. And one of the key differentiators here is the, the container image for the operator already contains the roles or the playbooks to launch that. And usually, uh, with the execution environment, you don't have that. You will get it afterwards during the runtime. So the first question is, why should we use an Ansible operator? Because basically, with the operator SDK, you can do it already with uh, Helm and Golang. But it's rather hard, actually, for uh, for people to learn Golang or to spend like six months to learn it and then build the operator. For those who are interested in, uh, in that, actually I would recommend to join the workshop uh, held by uh, my colleagues uh, Matthias and Rose uh, who are holding this uh, workshop on, uh, on Saturday morning. For the others, well, welcome to this presentation. Uh, we are basically, we are going to embed Ansible within Kubernetes operator. So you can basically have a lot of advantages. You can take care of, for example, advantage of all the collections already being made by the community, by Red Hat, and by the vendor. So you have already an ecosystem to automate your things and uh, take care of advantages such as uh, the Jinja templating and so on. You can also read and understand code where when you read uh, Golang code, maybe you don't understand all, everything. So the steps to basically build this is simply using the operator SDK. So these two commands should basically already give you like a nice base. So for example, the init, so you select your domain. So here in this case, I, I chose like acme.com. Uh, it could be your company and so on. And basically you say which plugin you want to use. And then you want to create some kind of APIs to basically have like to extend the Kubernetes APIs uh, that you already have uh, with that. And basically you tell him, some, some parameters like the group, the version, the, the kind, and basically it will already scaffold a, a lot of things for you so you don't have to create everything from scratch. It will give you some kind of uh, uh, structure already. Uh, it's, it's quite a lot, so I, I broke it down into multiple parts. One is the roles. 
So basically, you will have something like that. So in that case, I created AWS config, and I would basically develop my role here. The difference with typical Ansible roles is that some of the default values will, will be coming from Kubernetes. I'm talking about the namespace. I'm talking about the name of your uh, instance. And that's the, main, that's the main difference. Then you have something at the bottom. You can see watches. It's basically what kind of resources you want to see or monitor within uh, Kubernetes. So in our case, it's going to be uh, AWS config. Uh, you, have other, you have heard about other kind of resources, such as deployment, such as uh, a replica set, and so on. That's the same idea. They will watch for these kind of resources and then have a reconciliation loop. But in our case, with Ansible, it will basically, based on event, we will launch some, uh, some roles based on, uh, based on that. Then there is a molecule folder. Uh, this is quite interesting. This is mostly for end-to-end -end testing. So whenever your role is ready and you want to actually test it, that's the recommended way to do it. So the, the folder is already uh, uh, created for you. You just have to put uh, the necessary test that you want. So end-to-end -end testing, you launch your operator, you launch your instance, what do you expect afterwards? Uh, is it correct? So that helps to basically uh, uh, check your quality, check your playbooks, and, and so on. So there are different steps, what we call like scenarios. Uh, and basically, we have like the destroy operator. Basically, w once you want to start with the test, you want to make sure your environment is clean. Clean off operator, clean off, uh, I mean, you clean off your own operator, uh, doing some, uh, some linting and so on. And ba basically, you want to create like either your custom, custom uh, your CRDs, your operator, and your instances. After that, as I said, you want to verify if, uh, if your app is up, uh, if you have some, uh, some configuration, and so on. And at the end, once it's successful, you may decide to promote your, uh, your image. So your container image, your many, meaning your operator, to the next stage. And at the end, you want to clean up these things uh, so that your test is basically over. In case of issues, anyway, it's, it's going to call this uh, destroy uh, step to basically clean up everything so that you do not have any leftovers. Then you have the config folder. So bas basically, where do you decide on uh, your manifest, uh, Kubernetes manifest? So we are talking about the CRDs. We are talking about like uh, the, your deployment of the operator, uh, rollback access, access control, and some other things, such as, for example, if you want to uh, uh, enable uh, extra uh, manifest. So we'll see what we can enable later on in the demo. And these manifests are given b basically by, uh, uh, they have like the format of uh, customized, so with customization files, and you can later on plug this in with uh, Argo CD, for example, uh, for uh, continuous deployment. So that's the base, basically, like whatever you want to do. You have the structure, you develop your playbook, you want to continue with, uh, with CI-CD, uh, and so on. And, but there are some things in the field that you can find uh, interesting. So first of all, this is just an example on how it works at the customer. Like, basically, you will not have all the network connectivity that you wish for. So we are talking about, for example, connectivity from one namespace, so your operator project, to the user namespace. So it may not be given that you have access to this port on, on any services on port 8080. So you cannot use some collections, for example, to directly connect there. But you can actually spawn another port or having a, a port available for you to do it. So uh, obviously, this is, uh, this is something to know. Uh, and this only applies to, let's say, the operator being on a different namespace than the target uh, uh, pod. When you want to configure other, let's say, um, systems outside of your namespace, so I'm talking really outside of OpenShift, then you obviously need to check this kind of connectivity as well. Uh, but then you can also use directly the collections. 
But in my case, yeah, I had to, uh, to really handle this with, uh, with care. Same thing for handling multiple namespaces. So the payload you may have to choose in terms of naming convention is extremely important. You cannot just have like uh, some, uh, some files name with static uh, names because basically we have a collision. Uh, so I'm talking more about like, um, yeah, cluster operator really having one operator that rules all of the different namespaces. So th this is like a trick here. So basically you need to pay attention to the, uh, to the payload uh, file name. For example, uh, here we're using like uh, the variable um, of the user, which is basically here user project, but it can be other types of names. This is to handle multi-tenancy basically. And here you will use like some, uh, some kind of uh, collections or, and modules coming from Kubernetes core. So mostly like Kubernetes CP and exec here. Uh, and that basically the, uh, yeah, the mode used to go. Then in terms of the management pod, well, it's better to have like already some uh, CPU and limit, CPU limits, memory limits uh, there, uh, because depending on the action that you are doing, let's say you want to back up a database, uh, you, you need these resources. So you cannot just have like uh, empty, empty resources there. Uh, it's not going to work in a corporate environment where you have like uh, resource quota, limit ranges, and so on. Then you need to have like this container image with all the tooling necessary, uh, all the binaries and so on. So you also have to maintain this kind of uh, image when you want to ship this operator. Uh, yeah, I already discussed about the backup part, but also for the restore. Let's say you want to restore your database. That's the same idea. In my case, it was mostly like doing uh, injecting and configuration. So basically, I take the payload uh, that the operator is giving me, and then I'm basically doing some, uh, uh, some injection using curl. But we'll have an example right after. Then we are talking about secret management. So with Ansible, usually what we are doing is we are taking uh, care of, uh, of all the secrets using Ansible Vault. In the operator, that's not the case. Uh, you, cannot use the, you cannot use the Vault at all. So you either rely on Kubernetes secrets, but they have limitations. So base64 uh, encoding. So this is not like secure. Uh, basically, we can. Uh, uh, so if you want to use GitOps, that's not a good approach. So there are different ways to uh, overcome this issue. Uh, you have like uh, the external secret operator with community support, you have others uh, th that are coming to OpenShift, uh, currently it's tech preview, so you should not do it in production. Uh, you can also use directly uh, things like Hashica Vault, uh, basically using uh, directly the collection to speak with Vault. So that's also a possibility, but you will need also to take care of the token and uh, a token can obviously expire, so you need to take care of all these aspects. So yeah, you can definitely use community.hashivault. Uh, uh, that's what I used at uh, customer because they had uh, Vault in place outside of OpenShift. Obviously, this is not an exhaustive list. There may be other uh, integration uh, with other vendors and so on. So as I said, for CI/CD, uh, you, can, uh, you can use a molecule. Uh, this is a recommended way for testing the operator. Uh, you can also do some tests uh, locally. Uh, that's not an issue. And obviously, uh, you can do a lot of integration, uh, including Tecton pipeline. That's what I did at most of my customers, where you have built that to basically uh, create and build your container, having Ansible and Molecule for the testing, and then Scopio for uh, the image promotion across different uh, container registries. So in terms of monitoring, so uh, how do you know that the Ansible operator is failing? So basically, you can have this uh, uh, operator metrics exposed, uh, and then you can basically check what's going on. So you get like uh, quite some insights regarding the number of failures of your operator, how long it takes for one reconciliation loop to happen, uh, and basically how many uh, instances are queued. So I'm talking about like when you are managing 20, 30, 50 instances at a time by the operator. 
one of the main uh, advantages is that you can basically see uh, how the queue is, uh, is going down, but then maybe you have like uh, uh, too much to handle. So I'm talking maybe you need to adjust memory uh, and uh, CPU of the operator to be faster. So maybe you don't want the reconciliation loop to, uh, to be like 10, 20 minutes, but you want to really uh, adjust that. On, on, the on, on the other hand, the Golang operator is much more uh, efficient uh, rather than the Ansible because Ansible is using uh, Python and you can have like operators taking four or six gigabytes for handling 10 instances. So you need to be aware of that if you want to develop like Ansible operators. Whereas the Golang usually, uh, you, you will not find this, uh, this kind of numbers. It's much lower in terms of uh, resource consumption. Then, I go to the next point, so the real world examples. Uh, any ideas which uh, project is using Ansible operator? Yes? I would rather use like, uh, so I'm going to show you which one <laughs> I'm talking about. Uh, so I would rather use the AWX operator that will deploy an AWX for you, and then you handle everything from there. Yeah, uh, this would basically mean that you have a state in a different kind of like database. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, f for sure. I, I saw the numbers, especially in terms of memory, you need uh, way more. And uh, you, you have to tune uh, uh, the operator uh, resources for that. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so the, the, the best example for uh, building the Ansible operator is basically AWX operator, so upstream. Uh, it basically installs AWX on Kubernetes in uh, minutes. Uh, we will see in that in the demo. Uh, we can also upgrade it, so the upgrade is, uh, is quite nice. Uh, you can also configure LDAP and do a lot of uh, various things such as backup and restore, and everything Kubernetes uh, uh, native. Uh, then, uh, it, it was not enough, so the, the downstream of AWS is the Ansible automation platform with uh, the automation controller. And basically, it was not enough, it was not enough for my customer. We presented that uh, last year and we created the six AP operator. Today I'm presenting the, uh, the upstream of it, or some parts, basically to take care of additional things. And basically they create CRs, uh, and then everything is done uh, in two steps. So yeah, I'm going to present that. Uh, so this is available now on uh, GitHub, so if you want to have a look, uh, feel free. So basically what it does uh, for this, uh, uh, Ansible operator is basically checks because here we have two operators. One is responsible for AWX and the other one just for the config, like custom config. And they should not clash with each other, right? They should not do the same thing. So this operator is basically checking if the AWX pods are ready because if they are not uh, ready, they cannot do anything. And then to create uh, an auditor user. This auditor user will be uh, useful for, uh, for basically scraping the AWX um, metrics. And then it will create as well a secret and a service monitor in, uh, in OpenShift to, uh, to be able to do that. So here's the demo, so multiple parts. Let's see if uh, the connection is working. So uh, let me see. Yeah, so basically we have two operators. One is the AWX operator uh, itself, 
upstream uh, and basically I'm just showing which kind of namespaces it's, uh, it's watching so we will focus on user 1 AWX uh, then there is another namespace called uh, AWS config operator so that's custom uh, so the image is available on uh, Quay uh, here you can see and that's the prerequisites at the moment then there is the second one where I'm acting as user at this point of time so I'm not admin I'm just uh, I'm, the, I'm just a user and I want to have AWX as soon as possible uh, in my environment and what I'm doing here is I go to the developer uh, view in, uh, in OpenShift and basically I have uh, created a quick start uh, so it's basically showing the user how to uh, provision there on AWX so you can provision that and have all the instructions in the YAML file and that's how it looks like for them so they can go to different steps so here AWX they tell what to do so here they say okay switch the perspective is already done click on search search for AWX we can using the operator you can also have like some samples so imagine you have all the specs here but you have no idea what you're uh, what you're doing so you just follow the, like, the steps you will have everything preloaded for you so you can make the uh, developer experience way better uh, so they don't have to search for the documentation and so on uh, they can tune the, the route host as that means where it's available and then once it's uh, once it's ready you just uh, press uh, create so here is a waiting time so basically I'm just uh, I'm, I'm just uh, waiting here and basically within this uh, quick start you can see what they need to expect so here they are waiting for the status at the bottom so your s custom resource will have the, the status there and so you, you basically you need to wait a bit uh, go ahead uh, in the meantime yeah I'm checking the logs so these are the logs of the operator that gets triggered uh, so these are like the output of the Ansible role and uh, that's on the admin part and uh, here within the developer preview you can see basically uh, uh, what's going on within, uh, within the developer namespace so things are getting like hooked uh, there is a migration of database as you can see and uh, it takes a few minutes for, for this to be ready uh, after a while everything is ready so you're uh, you can just go ahead so as you can see it was upgrading and so on and uh, you will be able to access the, the UI after a few uh, few more minutes so the migration is done you can access the, the UI so the, the, the credentials are stored like as a secret and then uh, you can see within the status there that is basically like the expected uh, uh, status there so that, that's the first part and this is upstream already this is uh, used like uh, widely already either by uh, by the community or by the by enterprise uh, customers so then I have the, like the next two videos to finish so this is this was the first part now we have the second part uh, let me just wait a bit so that the quality is better uh, let me see yeah so uh, so we were talking about the first one so as you can see the playbook has been run we have 90 tasks done some are skipped because it, it, it this is idempotent so if he sees like some uh, some differences that you run it again until it works next step they will create AWS config and this is basically my customization this is my automation where I'm presenting today to uh, uh, to show you how easy it can be done uh, once again using samples so that uh, it's uh, it's easier for the for the end users and then you just need to wait uh, a few seconds and that's what you expect on the right side uh, it's just a name it's just a name meta it's just a metadata you can call it uh, whatever you want and you need but you need to tell 
the second operator, how the first one was called. So you can call it, for example, Tony, and then you reference it as Tony. Here it was just because I pre-filled uh, everything, it's because I want it to be deterministic. Uh, if it doesn't, if let's say I put AWX example on the first attempt, and I say, oh, it's called Tony, it will check if the AWX pods there are actually present. If not, they will just throw an error. Uh, so it creates everything in, uh, in seconds, and you reload uh, the status, and everything is uh, ready. Uh, now, what did I do with my automation here? Like, uh, it, it went so fast. So basically, uh, it created, first of all, an Acme auditor user in the background when you created the AWX uh, auditor, and it creates some secrets and service monitor in OpenShift. So it created multiple things in sync, in uh, yeah, in, in terms of uh, seconds or minutes. Last part. So basically, I'm talking about uh, how to monitor as well AWX. So we are basically having this auditor user. This is our read-only user. And basically what I'm doing is I want to expose the metrics for Prometheus, uh, the Prometheus metrics for AWX. And as you can see, like a 10, 10, we just got it. It doesn't seem impressive, uh, but actually there is uh, quite some automation around it. And this is to make sure your AWS uh, metrics are being exposed uh, there. And, and that helps later on uh, to basically, when you, whenever you want to run it in production to see uh, things like, uh, like that. And you can see that it's being scraped in API v2 metrics. And I will show you now a screenshot um, uh, where, where you can see like what I mean in terms of importance. So that's the monitoring dashboard that I did at uh, customer that we presented last year. So on the top part are OpenShift metrics regarding container resources. So I'm talking about real container uh, memory and uh, CPU. So mostly the memory. On the bottom side is AWX, like the running jobs that they have, as well as the pending one. And you can see it's correlated. I mean, uh, uh, the, the more jobs you run, the more uh, memory it will consume over time. So you can see how later on you can basically say, hey, but I'm having like, uh, I'm basically using everything I can during the night, and uh, I can basically optimize this, maybe having like, more spread, having like uh, uh, this uh, task like uh, in, in parallel and so on. And I have tremendous amount of jobs. Maybe it can also be like uh, optimized, right? So my point is any customer that basically uh, wanted AWX or uh, automation controller within the customer could have it in minutes and just go ahead and, uh, and, and use it at the customer uh, in the customer environment. And Ansible operator can definitely help you doing that. So the code is basically in GitHub. This is just a, a quick demo to show you, okay, you can do that very easily and you can uh, basically extend it as well and to fit any, any kind of scenarios. So yeah. So we are coming to the end of this uh, presentation. Uh, here are the references. So if you want to, uh, to have a look at it, the first one is, uh, is my favorite, but I also like to, uh, to read more about like the operator SDK reference regarding Ansible. Uh, they provide a lot of tips uh, regarding development, regarding testing, and so on. And uh, yeah, so, so there are some uh, blog posts and uh, some recording from last year. So now it's time for uh, your questions. Thank you. It, it just adds the, it just exposes the, the metrics automatically via, and it, go, it gets like scraped by an auditor user that we created on AWX uh, so that you uh, don't have to do it yourself. Uh, otherwise, the user has to go to uh, AWX, create the user, create the secret in OpenShift, create a service monitor, and it adds maybe five, 10, 15 minutes uh, of their time, and you can actually automate this uh, for multiple tenants. Yeah. Is there some link to configure uh, projects, uh, et cetera, the operator, or do you just use? Maybe it's not the best use case for it. Oh. 
Yes. I, I could, uh, sorry, uh, I can't see. Yeah, so you can use like flags. So for example, like in the uh, custom resource uh, instance, you can have like variables that you can use to say, okay, I want this feature, but not everything. And then I within your Ansible code, you can basically say, uh, you can use like conditionals with when. So not all the customers, for example, want LDAP configuration, right? So you, you, can, you, you, can, you can play around with uh, the input from the customer and uh, and basically give them what they want, but you, you should not uh, give them uh, all the features by default, right? So uh, yeah, I invite you to uh, have a look at the AWX operator. It's uh, quite, uh, it has a lot of use cases and uh, uh, it's getting better and better uh, every month. Yeah. Uh, I think service mesh is uh, Golang. And there are other operators like Splunk. Splunk operator is actually built uh, with, uh, with Ansible. Uh, there, there are others and uh, probably my colleagues who are basically enabling uh, partners can uh, tell you more. Yeah. Good, so thank you for your attention.